This is a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today, research motivation. Why are we talking about this? Why do we care? Is there a real reason that we have to go into this technology? Don't we have new and emerging technologies and the state of the practice to the, meet the demand of the industry and to continue moving forward with our 7 billion plus population? Uh, what is internal curing? And the next two, why do we care? And how does nanosilica impact internal curing? Those are the three big ticket walk away items that are very important to me that y'all understand. And if you can't answer these questions, I have not done my job and please ask questions. Like Joel said, please, no holds barred, ask any question relevant to concrete and nanosilica. If you have questions about the stock market, I won't be able to answer them well. I did do well back in the early 2000s, but not good enough. So uh, after that, we'll wrap it up with a concise summary and open up the floor for any questions. So like I said, my name is Dr. John Belkowitz. I've been in the concrete industry since I had a full head of hair. I uh, started helping mom and dad uh, pay for rent by being a mucker's apprentice. And what that basically meant was I showed up at the job site 4 o'clock in the morning, got the boots out, got the tools out, got coffees, went to school, came back. If I was lucky, I would learn how to finish a little bit. And then I would clean up all the equipment and bring beers out to the boys for the end of the day. So I really started out at the bottom end of the concrete industry. And from there, I went to the United States Air Force, where I was in a civil engineering squadron. And our mission was to provide, prepare, and sustain bases as the platform for the projection of airspace equipment around the operational continuum. What that meant as an 18 year old kid, I traveled the world, met new people all over the world, and placed concrete with them, and literally was living the concrete dream, living and loving the concrete dream. Uh, after that, I went back to school, the Air Force Academy. Uh, they were gracious enough to give me a civil engineering education and then put a lot of money into me to educate me on concrete. Uh, from there, I ended up getting out of the Air Force, going to Lafarge, North America, uh, working with them as a concrete formulator, worked my way up the ranks. I was one of the youngest formulators that they ever had. Um, and, and ultimately wanted to get to a point where I could have more freedom in research and development, technical transfer of new and emerging technology. And, and that's where we're here today. My beautiful, wonderful wife and I created a company years ago that combined some of these new emerging technologies that might get lost in a university basement with the trials and tribulations that we have to go through a commercial lab to bring things out to the industry. And there's a gentleman named Rich Seishi. And if you don't know him, He's an awesome, awesome dude. He coined the phrase of bringing bookcrete to labcrete and then realcrete. And that's what we do. Uh, my mentor, Brian Green, once told me, John, if it ain't gray concrete coming down the chute, it might be a great technology, but it's just not going to make it to the industry. There we go. OK, so research motivation. Why do we do what we do? My, my wonderful wife said years ago, our biggest problem in the concrete industry is that we're using uh, yesterday's technologies to solve, or today's problem we're solving with yesterday's technologies. Um, and ultimately, we are going to be forced to make new decisions about new technologies to take over those more mature technologies. So I love this construction material. The entire world loves this construction material. We have over 600,000 concrete bridges in our national inventory, establishing a $48 billion a year industry. Of that, $8.3 billion is put back into concrete every year to deal with the maintenance associated with physical and chemical attack. And I'm not saying concrete is broken. There are a few people who might have heard this once or twice today. I'm not saying that concrete is broken, but we definitely need to enhance it. If I bought a truck for $50,000 in the same year I owned it, first year, if I put 8,000 back into it, that truck might not be all the way broken, but we definitely need to do something to enhance its durability. And that's what we need to do with concrete. This is a, a real picture here. This is what I see through New Jersey to California. If I go to New Zealand, Australia, to Finland, I see the same thing. We need to find a way to enhance our concrete durability, not only for steel corrosion, but for alkali silica reactivity. This is Denver International Airport. We see this throughout the runway, throughout the taxiways, everywhere, even the parking garages. You'll see alkali silica reactivity all over the place. I had a YouTube video up where I go crazy over a column in a Denver International parking garage where you can actually see the gel being pulled out of the Isle of Man cracks. I'm talking 120 degrees between each crack. I mean, it was textbook ASR, and it's everywhere. So if you want to learn about ASR, Denver International is a great place to go. Um, and we've known about this ASR problem and how it's getting worse. Back in 2009, uh, the Department of Interior released a paper that gave us the top three reasons why we should expect ASR to get worse, and those are those three reasons. 
Read the paper. It's a fantastic paper. They got the conclusions right in front, so you don't have to skip to the end. Um, but it goes into that we're using different types of cement. In the late 90s, we had a huge cement shortage. We're getting some cements from uh, Asia. They were called uh, Asia, China, India. They were called China-based cements. Higher blame finest, higher alkalis. We got 28 day strengths in 24 hours, okay? That might be an exaggeration, but the contractors love that we could get the speed. Now, we transformed to that type of cement, and we've been trying to go back to these Hoover Dam cements, but the unfortunate reality is we like the speed of being able to get on and off the job site quickly. So with that, we've had a different type of aggregate that we're using. I'm not saying that aggregate has changed, but where I come from, the Rocky Mountain State, so it actually has rock in our name of our state, we don't have enough rock anymore. We're about five years away from losing our sand, and we're just not opening any more pits. We're bringing in rock from Wyoming, from Utah, and it's still just not meeting the grade, and it's because of ASR. Now, ineffective Poslins, I don't want to get into an argument about if you're from Chicago and you live right down this block from a power plant, because yes, you have more than enough Class F fly ash, and I commend you. But if you're from one of Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Texas, Colorado, California, you don't have Class F fly ash. Or if you do, it's in limited supply, or the quality is pretty bad. Now, if you don't believe you're one of those states, within the next one and a half years, 13 states is where we're at without Class F fly ash. By 2021, 16 more states will be added to that list. So we'll get 29 states out of the continental United States that are not getting their Class F fly ash volumes to mitigate ASR. Corrosion of reinforcing steel. The Portland Cement Association stipulates that corrosion of reinforcing steel is one of the leading causes for premature concrete failure and premature concrete tear out. I call this the sea of green. Can you tell why? It's not because of the color. That costs a lot of money. And you know what? If you chip or nick any of that epoxy like they're doing in the background, bless them, those contracts are doing the best they can do. The efficacy of that coating is just not there anymore. So what we want to do is make sure we create a concrete that not only meets the demand of construction, but it also gives us a return on value, whether it's cost, money, or on the job site time. And of course, the last one, and I think a lot of y'all feel this in here, resilient flooring systems and the degradation of resilient flooring systems. We have glue breakdowns for moisture migration, from alkali migration, and the unfortunate reality is years ago, we changed the way we do resilient floors. We used to have amazing asbestos, breathable tiles. Yeah, they killed people. They gave them mes mesothelioma. But still, they were amazing tiles, right? Then we had these glues that were solvent-based glues. Yeah, they might have caused cancer. But they didn't break down as, hard, as easy. Now we have vinyl tiles because we do care about our contractors and we want them to live. I've been doing this 30 years. When I hear somebody say I've been doing this 30 years, I hear that two ways. I hear the pride, I've been doing this 30 years, but I've also hear, I've been doing this 30 years. I don't know any different. I do this because I'm okay with the things that break. I understand the things that break. You give me something new, I have to learn something new. And I'd rather deal with the stuff that I already know that's constantly breaking. Because I see this everywhere. I love going to TJ Maxx, Ross, Marshalls, Kohl's with my wife because I love seeing this stuff. It's fun. I know that sounds strange, but hey, we all have our hobbies. Um, so why do we care about internal curing? Man, this is a tough crowd. Don't worry, I got the hair joke coming up here in a little bit. That one's a better one. That one's a better one. So what is internal curing? I believe before we dive into internal curing, a definition is warranted, and everyone in this room is going to have their own definition, and I'm going to fall back on the definition cited by ACI uh, CT18. The American Concrete Institute has a dictionary for concrete terminology, www.concrete.org. It's free to download, and this is their definition for internal curing. Supplying water throughout a freshly placed cementitious mixture using reservoirs via pre-wetted lightweight aggregates that readily release waters, water as needed for hydration or to replace Moisture loss through evaporation or self-desiccation. I really like that definition. But it pigeonholes us. It says internal curing can only be given to you by a pre-wetted lightweight aggregate. This is what I think the change should be. It gives us a lot more room to use new and emerging technologies. And please bear in mind, you don't see anything about nanosilica in there, do you? It says super-absorbent polymers and hydrogels. 
I wanted to leave it open to every technology, nanosilica, nanoalumina, carbon nanotubes, graphene, super absorbent polymers. There are other things out there besides lightweight aggregate and nanosilica that can give you that internal curing, and why not use them? I am a huge proponent for E5. I am a huge proponent for nanosilica. But the most important thing is that everybody in this room recognizes that you will not be able to rely on those mature technologies for much longer. Mark my words, in two to five years, you're going to be forced to make this decision. And if it's not E5, it'll be somebody else's technology. A brilliant gentleman just said earlier that it might not be the industry that's forcing you, it might be your competitor. Because your competitor is using it because they've seen the change. They've seen the difference, and then eventually you're going to have to start using it because your competitor is using it. Thank you, by the way. Um, why do we care about internal curing? So like I said, when I first started in the industry, full head of hair, majestic. I used to dye it purple and red. My father told me, you keep doing that, Jonathan, you're going to lose your hair. I said, Dad, what do you know? What do you know? Of course, he knows everything. So uh, what happens when we allow water to leave the concrete, or what we call concrete bleeding? When I was a kid, when I was 14 years old, and I ditched school to go finish concrete, and I swear my father was going to break my legs every time he heard from my boss, hey, Jonathan did a great job today. What I always was told was, wait for that water. You want to wait for that sheen. Wait for it. Because that sheen, that water at the surface, is going to make that concrete creamy and dreamy and easy to close up. It's not going to be bony and nasty, creamy and dreamy. So I grew up for a very long time expecting that water and using that water. The problem with using that water, and there's a whole bunch of people out there who have written articles, we've done the standardized tests, who've elucidated what happens is we get this subsurface and surface uh, breakdown. By increasing the water at the surface, you're reducing the, or you're increasing the water cementitious ratio. By increasing the water cementitious ratio, you're effectively reducing the glue that holds everything together. Our hydrated cement matrix is the backbone of concrete strength. And within that is the calcium silicate hydrate. That is the true superhero of concrete strength. If you add more water to it, you're replacing that glue with something that's not going to bear strength. And unfortunately, that Surface, that subpar surface, that's our first line of defense. I don't care if you're doing resilient floors, industrial warehouse floors, if you're doing pavements. It's our first line of defense. By doing that, by allowing bleed water to occur, we're creating a non-homogeneous mix. Meaning, when we mixed up that concrete, when it was in our truck, when it was coming down the chute into our forms, it was a homogeneous mix. It was all universally mixed together. When we allowed that concrete to sit through our ACI definition, which is up there, We've got this segregation, this, this dropping of our heavier materials, and it forces our water to be squeezed out the surface. So this is our concrete slab, a cross-section, rudimentary. It's not to scale, by the way. So rudimentary slab, we have our water universally mixed throughout. Over time, our other heavier particles, what? Specific gravity of cement is 3.16. Flash is 2.8. Our rock is somewhere between 2.6 and 2.7. Does anybody know the specific gravity of water? One. So that's the lightest stuff outside of air, and it'll be pushed to the surface. And that's what this rudimentary drawing is trying to show you. So because of that bleeding, we go away from all the work that we did for bookcrete, labcrete, and realcrete. So how does nanosilica impact internal curing? And before I, I get into nanosilica and how it impacts internal curing, I wanted to give you a definition, especially for folks who didn't know what nanosilica is. And nanosilica is a very generic term. Nanosilica either be in a powdered form or it can be in a liquid form. If anybody ever tries to sell you a powdered version of nanosilica, turn and run in the other direction. We don't want to use nanosilica. One, it's not, it goes against all our EHS, environmental health and safety protocol. And two, even if you get past that stuff, you ignore the health uh, uh, por uh, portion of it, you cannot universally mix a dry powdered nanoparticle into suspension. That's why we use liquid additives. Healthier? I mean, who here likes beer or ketchup or wine? Ice cream? Nanosilica is in that stuff. Yeah. And no, it's good. It's used as a clarifying agent in wine. So, you know, you ever see wines that have no sediment in there? They use nanosilica. Well, remember when I was a kid, you had that Heinz ketchup commercial. 
or you just had Heinz ketchup in the bottle and the juice used to come up to the top. You know what I'm talking about? That fructose syrup in the water. Do you see that anymore? Well, chlorosilica keeps everything in suspension. So nano, excuse me, nanosilica has a particle size from one to 100 nanometers in diameter. And that's as per definition from ACI 241, which is uh, nanotechnology of concrete. We use it in a liquid dispersion. It takes all the EHS risks away. And of course, there's an attorney in the room, and I don't want to say all. So it takes most, if not all, the uh, risks away. Um, and also, it's easier to use compared to silica fume, where you had a guy standing or a gal standing over the hopper, chopping bags and shaking them up there. I mean, now we have new OSHA compliances that protect folks, but still, it's cumbersome. With using a liquid material, you can fit it into your normal sequencing, your critical path of making and delivering concrete. This is what it looks like under a microscope. When I first came to the industry, we were using class F fly ash. We were getting it for 10 to $20 a ton, and we called it the poor man's water reducer. And man, did it make concrete creamy and dreamy and easy to place. Nowadays, we don't have that fly ash. We have a drastically different fly ash. And again, if you're from Chicago or certain parts of Pennsylvania, where you have a coal combustion plant for power right next to your house or right next to your plant, I'm not talking to you. But for the rest of us who have to deal with the limitations of what we have for mature technologies, is this a savior or snake oil? And that's what we're here to find out today. So this is uh, under a transmission electron microscope. This is a uh, 10 nanometer particle. Um, and it is uh, floating in a solution, as you can tell. It kind of looks like a ball bearing, has that rounded look to it, which is similar to the class of fly ash that we used to use decades ago. Still looks, fly ash still looks like this, but it has more impurities. So what we get out of nanosilica, those key benefits, the first one is because we're using silica and we have calcium hydroxide in solution, we get something called pozzolanic reaction. It's the same thing we get out of fly ash, out of silica fume, out of metacaolin, where you have this consumption of calcium hydroxide with that silica to produce more of that superhero of concrete strength, the calcium silicate hydrate. We also get something called particle to particle packing or void filling. Now you will see the same thing with your silica fumes, your fly ashes, but this happens on a much smaller scale. The nano silica that we're using, somewhere between a one and a hundred nanometers. A hair, you ready for my joke? A hair on a human head is around 150, well, not the hair on my head, obviously, but the, ha, ha, ha. Come on, I was trying hard there, folks. Um, a, a nanoparticle is one to 100 nanometers. Human hair is 150,000 nanometers in diameter. A water molecule from end to end is 3.4 nanometers. So we're effectively using particles that are smaller than a water molecule. And what we see from using this technology is that we create an environment that is not conducive to physical or chemical attack. Going into a little bit deeper about why we care specifically about nanosilica, there's three chemistry things. Now, I don't want to go too much into the chemistry, and I tell you, I've written a, a PhD dissertation on it. It's 200 and, uh, 279 pages of pure poetry. Mark Twain could not write, write a better book. I mean, you're going to love this when you, and it's free. You don't even have to pay for it. It's free online. So we've got three main reasons. One, that pozzolanic reaction. The difference being is we have a higher amount of free silica surface area for that pozzolanic reaction. So it happens faster, and there's more of it going on compared to silica fumer class F fly ash. There's a wonderful paper written by Stephen Land back in 2012 where he calls nanosilica because that that instantaneous pozzolanic reaction happens, he calls it, the nanosilica, a calcium silicate hydrate seeding effect and a beautiful in illustration of standard microsilica versus nanosilica as well as the scientific explanation. And what you're gonna hear from me today is uh, using a lot of these big science words because that's what you need to understand what we're getting into here. We're, we're really getting into a new technology for the industry despite the fact that this stuff has been around since the 1800s. Our first patent here in the United States was in 1959. The first time we used colloidal or nanosilica in concrete is with the US Army Corps of Engineers when they made a rock matching grout for nuclear payload uh, explosions. And they had to use nanosilica as a viscosity modifying agent. So there's a lot of history to this. And I can tell you, you're not gonna be the guinea pig. You're not gonna be serial number one. And that's what we're gonna show you today. 
So outside of the instantaneous pozzolanic reaction, you also have something called accelerated cement dissolution. I love that phrase. It sounds scientific, and it's very important to us. Man, we need to get a ball up here. So you take a ball or your cement particle, proverbial cement particle, and you drop it into a bucket of water. What you're going to have is dissolution of the tricalcium and dicalcium silicates at the surface and subsurface, and you're going to have the soup of calcium and silica. And once we precipitate out our calcium hydroxide, you have this supersaturated soup of calcium and silica. And once we get that ratio from 0.7 to 3.2, you start having this polymerization of that superhero of concrete strength, the calcium silicate hydrate. The problem with that is, is not only does that calcium silicate hydrate grow out to free space, it also grows into the particle, effectively creating a diffusion barrier, what I like to call an M&M hard candy shell. And because of that creation of the M&M hard candy shell, we're not getting as much water into that unreacted or anhydrous cement. So we effectively lose, depending on whose paper you look at, anywhere between 30 and 70% of that cement. Now, we've tried to get past that in our industry by doing what? Grinding up the cement, making it smaller. You still run into the same problem. A gentleman named Bjorn Bjornstrom back in 2003, 2004, and then there was, uh, and he's in Sweden, but then there was another gentleman at Georgia Tech, uh, Jamal Jayalapan, who looked at nanotechnology, nanosilica and nano TiO2. And what they found from nanoparticles was that we could get a greater breakdown, a dissolution of our cement at early stages. So we're effectively getting more bang out of our cementitious buck. Trademark, John Belkowitz. Um, the last thing that we see out of this is something called heterogeneous nucleation. And what that basically means is really small things will force other things to grow on it. So we have our micro silica, like your silica fume, your class F fly ash. They're a thousand times bigger than what we're talking about today. And when you put those things in a solution, whether it's water or cement paste, what happens is these ions collect at the surface. And if you're a Star Trek or a Star Wars fan or anything like that, what this basically is, is a force field. And the bigger that force field is, the longer it takes for things to grow on it. So when we're using a nanosilica, because it's so much smaller, because it has so much more surface area, we see less ions on the surface. And because we see less ions on the surface, we see a smaller force field. And because we have a smaller force field, things will want to grow on it. So these are the three things that we see out of nanosilica that gives us reason to jump on that increases cementitious efficiency, increases durability, and ultimately makes a concrete that is stronger and lasts longer. So I, I want to take you to, on a trip to my PhD real quick. I'm very proud of my PhD. I sacrificed a lot for it, um, and I, was, um, I worked with a lot of amazing folks. Uh, and this was the, the impetus of my PhD. Uh, the title of my PhD is The Impact of nan Nanosilica Size and Surface Area on Alkali Silica Reactivity in Concrete. And what we were dealing with in Colorado is a major reduction in fly ash. We are traditionally using anywhere between 15 and 35 percent class F fly ash to mitigate ASR. And when I was still a young man working in Colorado, we saw the shortages happening. That paper that I showed you was back published in 2009 from the Army Corps or from the U.S. Department of Interior and the Denver Federal Center. That research had started a decade before that paper was published. So we've known about this class F fly ash problem for decades. Now, when I was starting this project, we had to be able to replace our class F fly ash with something to meet the demand of ASR. So what we did in this. So we have three nanosilicas, nanosilica one, two, and three. All three of them are different sizes. So this is the smallest, this is the medium size, and this is the biggest. And what we did is, you see these dosages are changing, right? So what we did is we measured the instantaneous silica surface area that was coming from a 20% class F fly ash mix. So we measured that and back calculated how much nanosilica we would need to get that same amount of silica. Now, all of a sudden, this turns from a civil engineering project to a material science and a chemistry project. I have two civil engineering degrees, one mechanical engineering degree, and a material science degree. My background is concrete, making and breaking concrete. I had to dive into the wild world of chemistry to truly understand this. And if y'all truly want to understand why this works, 
You'll have to do that to a certain degree too. And hopefully, I'm helping you all out with that today. So we wanted to show that you cannot treat nanosilica like fly ash, like silica fume. It's its own totally different entity. And we did that by looking at the instantaneous. So we're getting the same amount of silica as we get from fly ash over here. And then we increase the dosages to see the impact. This was an amazing project. This PhD took me around the world working with amazing people through government agencies as well as private industry. And I believe that if I had not worked with these groups, now, I wouldn't be standing here today. And ultimately, what I didn't want to be was a lab rat. And that's not a derogatory term. There are some PhDs who spend their entire PhD in the lab, in the basement. Nobody gets to see their work, and then it's published. I wanted my stuff to be out in the open, so if there was some BS, somebody would wave the flag quickly. So this was our first commercial trial. Uh, it was the first application of nano-engineered concrete in the United States. We actually did this back in 2011. We got the award in 2012, and the pu paper is published in Concrete International, the ACI journal, uh, but it was published in 2014. Um, I do have time to go into the data set on this, right? OK, cool, 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 cool. Let me just make sure where we are. OK, so um, this was an interesting job. I'm going to get into the data set of why it was interesting, but ultimately what we found out of this is we had to meet two demands. The demand of opening traffic at 24 hours, and the long, which is short term, and the long term demand of creating a concrete that was not susceptible to ASR and didn't have to be torn out at six months to a year, because that's when they were tearing this stuff out. We did another job site uh, published at Denver International Airport. Um, we've got a lot of mag chloride in Colorado. Uh, they love it. We have a winter and summer blend. Yeah, we use a summer de icing blend. So anytime, I know. Yeah, any time in the summer where any place in Colorado gets below 30, we start using our blend. And when they have too much of it, they just spray it out on the runways or the parking lots. So we have a big problem. What we end up seeing is that concrete breakdown early. It's softening up our concrete surface. We cannot get away from the abrasive wear from traffic. We're getting more traffic, heavier loads of traffic. And ultimately, what we're seeing with our standard concrete, they were seeing this nonstop, this loss of our broom finishes. We don't do tiny anymore out in Colorado, or especially on our runways, but at the very least, our expectation was after six weeks, I should have my broom, my broom finish. It shouldn't just wear away. And unfortunately, after six weeks in Colorado, we're losing that. And we're losing more than that at six months. And at one year, well, I implore you to check out the YouTube videos of Denver International. It's pretty cool. And if you look at Jackson Gap Street, at Denver National Airport, they have what I like to call the five Mount Everests of torn out concrete. And if you think I'm bashing Denver International, I'm not. I'm actually one of their consultants. And we're trying to help them get rid of these five Mount Everests of concrete by using nanosilica enriched recycled concrete aggregate. So we are trying to help the world make the world a better place after the fact, but we'd rather do it beforehand by making that concrete stronger and last longer. Quick story. I promise this is a quick story. Um, my best friend from the Air Force Academy uh, stayed in the military, and he worked his way up the ranks to the point that he was working for President Obama and President Trump. And he was gracious enough to get some invitations to meet them. Uh, first time I got to meet the president, we went to go visit, meet President Trump, or President Obama, uh, uh, at Peterson Air Force Base. And Whitney, it was the dead of summer, it was 100 plus degrees out. Whitney was pregnant out to here. Like she was ready to pop. This is my beautiful, wonderful wife. And uh, we're standing out in the taxiway. It's hot as all get out. And Air Force One lands. And then it parks. And then my best friend, Wesley, Lieutenant Colonel Wesley Niles Spurlock III, walks in. I'm so proud of him. My brother is walking down. And I, I look down, and I see this D cracking. And I'm taking pictures. And next thing you know, Whitney's like, Jonathan Samuel Backwoods, you take pictures of the president. And I'm not making a political comment, but to me, the pictures of D-cracking were more important than President Obama. I'm not making a political comment. I'm really not. The reason why I'm saying that, when I was in the Air Force, and please bear in mind I was in the Air Force for 10 years, and I worked on a flight line. I worked on um, generators and aircraft arresting systems, and then I was switched over to concrete. But to us, this had two acronyms, both the same. It's the military, so we have a whole bunch of acronyms. Foreign object debris, that's what all those little rocks are. And the foreign object de debris causes foreign object damage. And we used to walk the flight line picking up things. 
whether it was rocks, bolts, dead birds, anything could really destroy most of these jet engines. And here's Air Force landing, and you got this all over the place. Now, Nick, who here ever flies into Denver or Colorado Springs Airport? There it is, loud and proud. Don't believe me. I don't want you to believe me. You gotta see it for yourself, because I don't believe it when I say it. We had to drop off my sister-in-law at Colorado Springs Airport. I, the cops went and came and spoke to me because I was walking all over the parking lot taking pictures of this de-cracking, this concrete that's falling apart. We're comfortable with this. We're okay with this. I was once told that concrete was started with the letter C because concrete cracks. We can't be okay with that anymore. As architects, engineers, and contractors, our job is to always look for the future. It's not our future, it's our children's future. Right now I've got engineers all over the world who are designing not 40 year structures, but 100 year structures. And they're not gonna be around. Like what, they're in their 30s to their 60s, maybe 70s, and you're, design you're gonna be 170? We're designing this for our children. And I understand that there's some fear. There's some fear of using a new technology. And as engineers, we sometimes we overthink things. Our job, as engineers, contractors, and architects, is to take that fear, that knowledge, and connect it to our gut. There's a disconnect. We have to take chances. There was a time that we didn't use fly ash. There was a time we didn't use silica fume. Per Fittichstol, back in the 60s and 70s in Norway, brought silica fume to our industry. My uncle Rob, Robert Lewis, from Elchem, I guess Norchem, and whatever other company he works with nowadays, helped bring that, but there was a time nobody wanted to hear them. Silica fume was the devil. High range water reducers went through the same thing in the early 2000s. And nano silica is going through it too, and I promise you, you will be using it within the next two to five years. Even if you are a naysayer, which I'm okay with, but either you're gonna be forced to by your competitors or by the climate of the industry and where we're at with raw materials. Okay, so um, I showed you bleeding. Now I wanna show you what nano silica is going to do in our hydrating cementitious matrix, our concrete composite. So we have this little area right here of water and concrete. Now in our previous slides that migrated to the surface. By using nano silica, we're effectively manipulating the molecular kinetics of cement hydration to enhance the porous sponge that makes up concrete. And the way that we do that is by enhancing the concrete at its birth, at its beginning. Somebody told me yesterday, in our industry, in our flooring industry, a lot of us don't realize that a good floor starts at the foundation. A good concrete mix and a good concrete slab. By using a standard concrete mix, you're leaving yourself open to, hey, if they put a little bit of extra water in the truck, if they didn't backspin their drum a little bit of water, that water's gotta come out. Eventually it's gonna come out. Using nano silica, we can assume that it's acting as a viscosity modifying agent, or it's holding back that water, where we get a true water cementitious ratio. And what we see out of that is we see that enhancement going through the entire hydrated cement matrix. Not only in the body of the cement, but also at the interfacial zone between the hydrated cement matrix and the aggregate. So ultimately what we see by using nano silica in concrete is a reduction in bleed water. And this is not something that's talked about, it's talked about but not enough. Where does that bleed water come from? And the answer is bleed channels. So even after that, let's say you didn't finish that water back into the concrete, you let it dry off, well you're still up the creek without a paddle because where did that water come from? It didn't magically appear. I mean, unless it rained on top of the slab, then it did magically appear, but it came from the body of the concrete. And the only way for it to get to the surface is through channels. And after this concrete hardens, well now your concrete is still susceptible to physical and chemical attack. Water back into the surface, channels that could lead to subsurface, body, and then the reinforcement of your concrete. And again, if you remember what I said earlier, the Portland Cement Association stipulates that corrosion of reinforcing steel is one of the leading causes for premature concrete failure and, of course, premature concrete tear-up. We're enhancing the concrete, but we're also stopping that water to migrate the surface, to dilute our cement paste, and by doing that, we're reducing our bleed channels, but we're also creating a better first line of defense. And what I mean by that, that cement cap that y'all call, that top surface 
It's going to stop water from migrating. It's the first thing that steel wheels hit when they're abrading the concrete. Once you get through that first line of defense, it's not the cement cap that you're worrying about now. It's not the hydrate cement matrix. It's the hydrate cement matrix. It's the sand. It's the dust. It's the rock. And the interfacial zone between all of them. So what we want to do, especially when we look at abrasive wear, whether you're doing ASTMC 779 or 1138 or your own version of abrasion, we want to maximize that top surface of our not just for resilient floorings, but also for pavements. Then, of course, we create a homogeneous mix, a more true mix for that bookcrete, that labcrete, and that realcrete. You know, I, I met Joe about a year ago. Year ago, next month? He recorded the phone conversation. Just learned that yesterday. So Joe, Joe and I spoke uh, almost a year ago. And I remember, it wasn't the first thing I said to him, but it was like the second or third thing. I said, you know, man, I got to be honest. I'm a little jealous. He's like, what do you mean you're jealous? So while I've put out technology that I I'm not a big fan of patents. I'm not a big fan of patent attorneys, to be honest. Um, there's only two patents in the concrete industry that I think that they're written. One is mine, because, you know, I wrote my own patent. The other one is Joe's. Joe didn't have the education that I had. Joe had that practical experience. He understood the enhancements that nanotechnology brought based off of his decades of work. And because of that, I believe he deserves that patent through and through. Pissed me off. I was jealous. But he came up with an innovative idea. This was not uh, an obvious innovation of an existing technology. It was a new way of using something new to the concrete industry. Good job, Joe. So the next step, and, and the next step, this red portion, this is what I'm going to go back to. A lot of y'all in here asked for data set. So I'm going to give you a lot of data, a lot. Data ad nauseum. We have ongoing concrete problems that we have few viable solutions. I don't care if you're relying on silica fume or, or fly ash or lithium. We just don't have those anymore. Medicaolin, yeah, it's going to start coming from Idaho, but they've been talking about that for a decade plus. Slag, we're we going to get slag from India and Asia? Well, what's the price on that going to be? Our cements aren't going to change. I don't care how much work ASTMC 150 does with Jason Weiss, Jason Eidecker, uh, Dick Burroughs. You're not going to get Hoover Dam cements. It's just not. And if I'm hurting your feelings, I don't mind. I'd rather hurt your feelings now than you to face the harsh reality a few weeks, few months, or a few years from now. Nanosilica has proved itself in the lab, out in the field, all over the world. I really don't mind if you don't believe me. A number of times people have said to me, to my face, as if I was a third person who was deaf, well, if 50% of what he's saying is true, I don't care if you believe 50% or 100%. My opinion is you shouldn't believe anything I have to say. You should try it for yourself. That's what we learned in school. Whether it was a school of hard knocks, civil engineering, what we learned in school is that we should not be OK with the state of the practice. We're always, as engineers, architects, and contractors, our job is to push that envelope. And that means failure. So if you think using a technology, new technology, you're not going to have problems, you're going to have problems. You've got to dial it in. You've got to teach your folks how to use it. Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to pay for the warranty? All these problems. But that's why we took on that responsibility. It's our job to make sure our children don't have to deal with the problems that we're creating today, our grandchildren. So my job today, and we'll break for lunch after this, is to communicate to you, the architects, the engineers, specifiers, contractors, finishers, whether you're in the DOT level, you're the commercial or residential level, my job is to educate you. I don't have a five-gallon bucket in the back of my truck right now. I don't make any commissions off of this, do I, Joe? Seriously? Not even a little bit? I don't make any commissions off of this. My job is to spread the word about a new and emerging technology that can help you meet the demand of construction while still creating a more sustainable world that we live in today, tomorrow, and for the future. So the first, first thing that I wanted to cover 
was this uh, commercial trial that we did at Eagle County Airport. Um, and I, as I had stated before, I had started out in the United States Air Force. That was my first real job, if you want to call it, out of high school. Um, and I, I saw pavements going down for flight lines all over the world. Uh, I was stationed in Aviano Air Base, Italy, as an 18-year-old kid. And I was, as soon as I got there, I told, hey, there's not enough room for you on the base, so you're going to have to get a house in the civilian world, in Italy, at 18, right? Uh, I was living the dream, making and breaking concrete in Italy. The food, it was a paid paradise. It was awesome. Um, so I saw a lot of concrete pavements go down in, in some nastier places, Northern Africa, Southern Africa, Kuwait, Iraq. I, I'd been to a lot of places. And the one thing that I understood is that there were a lot of limitations to this amazing construction material that we use every day. And when I came to Colorado, I was instantly educated on ASR. I mean, we have some aggregate that's so reactive that it glows in the dark. That's a lie. That is a total lie. Fabrication. <laughs> it's just very reactive. We've actually had to close down plants because we couldn't get aggregate from the local sources because we didn't have any more fly ash. When you need 35% class F fly ash to mitigate ASR, that is not a sustainable approach to concrete, especially when you're in the mountains of Colorado. I had a really good buddy of mine call me up on a Friday afternoon. Why is it always a Friday afternoon you get these calls? Friday afternoon, and this is the guy that once carried me after I sprained my ankle during the second basic training at the Air Force Academy. And this is the one that if you fail, you have to do the whole thing over again. And I'm stumbling through, and here's Timmy Broadman picking me up and getting me through it and bless him. Just and thing, finally got an ankle brace and I can get through it. Timmy Broadman calls me up on uh, Friday, four in the afternoon. He's uh, an engineer in some part of Colorado and he says, hey man, I need a letter from you. I need a PE stamp letter. I said, <coughs> heck yeah, dude, whatever you want, I will sign and then stamp that letter. He goes, cool, cool, cool. I got a 200 yard job pour on Monday and I got no class F fly ash. Can you write me a letter that says, I don't need fly ash in my concrete? And I said, heck no, dude. I like my business. I like my credibility. Uh, but that's what we've come down to. The industry is not going to wait. And if we hang our hats on these matured technologies, you're not going to be able to get insurance anymore. <clears throat> I'm predicting the future. And I could be wrong for some of you in this room. But eventually, if you're in this business long enough, the fly ash will go away. We cannot undo what we started in 1978. I don't care if you're a Trump supporter or not a Trump supporter. We're not going to turn those coal combustion uh, um, uh, manufacturing, whether it's for electrical manufacturing, whether it's for steam generation, we're just not going to do it. Not as much as we used to. And because of that, we're not going to have that coal combustion residue in the volumes and the quality that we used to get. And that's what we were dealing with up in Colorado. So we worked with Lafarge North America at Eagle County Airport, and the engineering team on that was um, uh, Javiation. And the reason why that's important is the main engineer on that was Angela Folkstead, who was one of my professors at the Air Force Academy. She loved concrete, loved Bruce Springsteen. I mean, she was the most awesome person in the world, and uh, really has, has been a, a huge proponent of me and, and our company over the years. So we had this uh, job site with, uh, or not even a job site, we had a demo with Lafarge North America at their gypsum plant. Uh, quality control manager had known me for years from my days at working Lafarge. And um, we were only supposed to do a 20 foot by 20 foot slab at the plant, which we did. We came back the next day and we were supposed to do some pie lasters. Oh, somebody's buying drinks. Um, we were supposed to do some pie lasters. Well, we did the pie lasters and the quality control manager fell in love with the mix. The creaminess, the dreaminess, the fact that he can reduce his high range water reducer, reduce his air, but keep all the same properties, absolutely loved it. And of course, the data set that went behind it. So he said, uh, you know anybody from Javiation? I was like, heck yeah, I know Angela. He's like, cool, can you give her a call and see if we can get this on an airport? I was like, what, next month? He goes, uh, well, no, like 15 minutes. And I said, probably not. Right? But I'll call her. So I called up Angela. I was like, hey, Angela, you're awesome. Your hair looks great today. Um, is there any way we can pour 40, 50 cubic yards of concrete on one of your runways? She goes, no, absolutely not. But you could do it. I said, well, how about a taxiway? She goes, no. I said, well, what can we do? She goes, you could do a parking apron. I said, cool. I'll stick with a parking apron. That's not a parking apron. 
It's actually in the middle of the taxiway. So this was a major job when Angela found out, and I didn't know that we were putting, I was still at the plant dialing in mixes, or dialing in trucks. When she found out, she lost her you know what. Rightfully so, as the, you know, specifying engineer, she's the one who's supposed to have say, so we'll see all the data sets well ahead of time in the job site. Um, so this was a risk, and we spoke about risk before, uh, and Angela didn't require this get torn out because she knew the people doing the research, she saw the research, and she believed that the research warranted the risk, especially since they were already tearing slabs out every six months to a year. So this was our job site. What we required on this job site was 3,500 PSI, by the way, an MPA, because I, I travel across the world, so everybody likes MPA outside of the big blue pond, or over the big blue pond. So 3,500 PSI at 24 hours. Remember, it was 20% uh, Class F fly ash mix. You're going to see it here in a second. And this was in the dog days of winter. Um, so they were tearing out slabs when the slabs weren't meeting strength at 24 hours. And what the quality control manager had to do was put 2% of a non chloride accelerator to meet the 3,500 PSI. And I asked him, what are you doing, man? You're setting yourself up for failure. And his reply was, John, I got to deliver concrete. If it don't meet the strength, I lose a customer. So we have somewhere around 600 pounds total uh, Portland cement. We had 20% of a class F fly ash. Here, this says 19.5% class F fly ash. Can anybody guess why it says 19.5%? No guesses? You get a lucky piece of concrete if you guess right. Wow, no trials on that one. Okay, so the, the engineer and the quality control manager needed to have 20% class F fly ash mixes. They didn't have a 0.1 or a 0.01 after the decimal place. They had 20%. So 19.5 rounds up to 20%. So what we did was we took our smallest particle, which had the highest reactivity, and only added 0.5%. And I, for dramatic effect, I put the, the nano silica in a pint glass. We had gone drinking the night before, and I had stolen a pint glass. Didn't know it, but so I had the pint glass. And our quality control manager looks at me and he says, dude, that's not going to do anything to my concrete. No scientific background, no academic education. Everything that he was trained on was at the practical level. And his intuition, his gut check said, there's no way that cup of what looks like water is going to work in my concrete. And that's some of the problems that we deal with day to day. Whether it's this if you're the engineer, or if it's this, if you're the contractor, you use one more or the other when you're in the different fields. Sometimes we use too much of it. As engineers, we use this too much. We overthink things, is what my dad says. As contractors, as finishers, we use our gut too much. You say, well, it just doesn't feel right. Oh, gut check says no. You gotta start connecting the two. And that's what I was able to do by talking to folks that I had relationships with, but I could do it with the data set too. So these were our mixes. Yes, they're all in metric, I apologize. So this was uh, 12 ounces per 100 weight. I believe this was six ounces per 100 weight. Uh, and we kept this consistent. It was a very low water cementitious mix because we were trying to get our strength pretty high at 24 hours. But more importantly, the job site was 15 minutes away. The hardest part about getting to the job site was not stopping at the German restaurant to get a snack before you go there. That slows down your trip. What they were concerned about is slump retention. That was the first thing they were concerned about. The reason why they use so much high range water reducer is because they had to keep their slump consistent all the way through 90 minutes. They were using a slip form paver so they knew it was gonna tighten up. But they started out 180 millimeters. What is that, divided by 25? Anybody do math quick? Divided, six inch slump, seven inch slump? Started a seven inch slump and they died all the way down to a one inch slump within 90 minutes or 120 minutes, excuse me. So what they ended up doing, <laughs> putting a little water in the back of the truck, souping it back up to a six inch or a five inch or a four inch, whatever they needed, whether they were doing slip form paver and they also did hand placement. With the nano silica, remember we took our high range water reducer dosage, which was, I believe it was Optima 256 by Creso, EMX, Optima 256 EMX by which they no longer sell, but amazing high range water reducer. We chopped that in half, and despite the fact that we chopped it in half, we still kept that.
pretension all the way through without, pissing, without adding water, without adding more high range water reducer on site. The other thing that they were looking for is strength. That 24 hour strength was so important to them. And because we were working with the engineer, because the engineer was looking at the batch tickets, they couldn't put that 2% non caloric accelerator. So what we found is at 24 hours, we weren't reaching that 24 MPA or that 3500 PSI that was specified by the engineer for early opening of traffic. And this was an opening of traffic to lightweight vehicles. This was the AARF, the um, air response, oh, AARF, the airfield air response facility. So it's where the firefighters were. And what, what the uh, quality control manager saw and got scared of wasn't the low strength, it was actually the high strength from the nano silica. And the reason why he was afraid is because normally when he put his non caloric accelerator in there, yeah, he got his early strength, but 28 days later he was barely getting his 5500 plus the over design. We took out the non caloric accelerator with the nano silica. We not only met and exceeded our 24 hour strength, but we skyrocketed in flight our 28 day strength. Now, this was amazing, and the quality control manager loved it. But as a quality control manager for a ready mix outfit like Lafarge, he fell back on his standards. He said, Fine, but I need to see the ASR tests. So I said, Cool. Colorado, we use um, ASTMC 1260 and 1567. If you don't know what it is, an accelerated mortar bar test. You make a one inch by one inch by 11 inch mortar bar with two nuggets on either end. You soak that in a sodium hydroxide solution for 14 and now 28 days at 175 degrees Fahrenheit and over a period of time, 3, 7, 10, 14 days, you're measuring the change in length of that mortar bar. So what we're getting is an aggressive environment that creates that scenario for ASR gel growth, for it to thrive and survive. And even with 20% class F fly ash and no non chloride accelerator, which I believe would have pushed it even higher at 14 days, we exceeded the 0.1% expansion required by FAA. This was the other reason why we had to give Lafarge a chance before we published this material. Because this is a mix that had been using for a while and they were tearing out slabs. So, and again, no disrespect to Lafarge if there's any ex-Lafarge employees. I'm an ex-Lafarge employee and we did the best dang job we could with those materials. Best dang job we could. Now, the, the third question that I got from the quality control manager, from the contractor, and from Angela, the engineer, was, what's this stuff going to do to my concrete in 10 years? And my answer was, anybody? I don't know. I really, I, I really don't know. I haven't been using this stuff for 10 years. You know, I, we're, we're going to find out, though. So they actually left this stuff in place. And Whitney and I went up for a nice little vacation, you know, the hot springs. Um, and on the left, you can see that standard concrete with moderate to extreme abrasive wear. These slabs are sitting back to back. One touches the other. So the vehicles go across both slabs. And you can actually see where the wheels have stripped away what I keep referring to as that first line of defense, that cementitious, that capstone, if you will, that's going to give us our resiliency not only de-icing salts, de-icing brines and freeze salt, but also to that abrasive wear that we get, especially from heavy vehicles rolling over. You could see that. Look, it's beautiful. I mean, it's gorgeous. You can even see aggregate coming out of it. And then you look at the nano-engineered with nano-silica. Placed the same day, same finishers, same methods, same machines, same mix design, except for a reduction in cement, a reduction in high range, and a, what, balance of air, and the nano-silica. And we're not seeing that wheel traffic. We're not seeing the, the ripping open of that surface to the point that we're ex, uh, exposing our aggregate. John, what type of wheels? Um, similar to like MRAPs, big wheels. Yeah, I'm not a specialist in that. <laughs> Apologize. So this is just a closer view. Um, you know, I actually we weren't able to core out samples, so I've got more pictures that focus on these aggregate. I even had my handheld microscope in there. But you can see that three-quarter inch aggregate shown at the surface. And by the way, this was not an exposed aggregate finish. 
So that is not what the owner wanted. That being said, we were able to keep that in place to see what it was going to do because it was in a non, you know, um, what's it called, a, a low, uh, low uh, hazardous or a low entry level environment for their aircrafts and their taxiway. So in Colorado, we've got a lot of problem with this freestyle, with the ASR, with our de-icing salts, and it leads to problems like this, problems that you saw earlier, even those problems that we see at Denver International Airport. So there was a group that got together years ago that was asking the question, is class F fly ash really helping us alleviate these woes and these pains that we feel from freestyle and the de-icing salts? And they found that it didn't work. And this was like three ready mix providers who got together with the Colorado Concrete Associate, Colorado Ready Mix Concrete Association. They found that fly ash wasn't doing the job that we expected it to. Expected it to. So we came back and we said, that's great. So let's see if we can identify if colloidal silica will help us out with this. And we wanted to set up the most aggressive environment out there. And we did a bunch of slabs and what have you. But what I want to show you today is the data set that's going to be published in ACI. So this is our mix. And because I'm working with a ready mix provider that is selling concrete, they didn't want me to share the exact mix design. So that's why you see these ranges. I'm just trying to be respectful of them. Um, what we did is we ran a number of tests. Uh, you're going to be seeing three of them, I believe. The first one, four of them, four of them, three of them, three of them with four slides. So the first one was uh, mass loss. Now, this was the concrete created by the ready mix provider. It's just, you know, your standard concrete. Uh, it's got nano silica in it. Uh, that company doesn't exist anymore, so I'll be changing that name. But we did this mass loss where we uh, cured up our concrete for 28 days. Then we started at zero days and cured it in a calcium chloride bath. And every single day, we did the six hour freeze and the 18 hour thaw, or six to eight, and then the 16 to 18 hour thaw. And then we did a mass loss. And uh, eventually at 28 days, we actually switched over to mag chloride. And that's when Colorado switched only from calcium chloride to mag chloride. So that's why we made the change. And as you can see, you know, we, I had said it earlier that nano silica is amazing, but it is not the silver bullet to every monster out there. And what we're still dealing with is concrete. It's not titanium. You know, it's not some alien material that we've got from another planet. It's concrete. Even when you make concrete on the moon, even when you make concrete on Mars, if you subject it to calcium chloride or mag chloride, it's still going to break down. So despite the fact that we're still breaking down, we're reducing that breakdown by 10 to 13%. Now what we did with that, we didn't stop there. We actually made somewhere around 1,000 samples. And not only did we test the samples for mass loss, but then we also tested the samples for compressive strength over the 90 days, or as it went out to 100 days. And what you could see out here is that the mag chloride, it's breaking down the concrete. And we're seeing that through the strength. We also did ASTMC 779 Procedure A, uh, which is an abrasion resistance test. And if you've never seen it before, it's one of my favorite concrete tests. The apparatus is absolutely beautiful. And we have a YouTube story on how that apparatus came to be. I was supposed to spend $3,000 on it, ended up spending $15,000 on it. And when Whitney wrote the check out for $4,500, she's like, what's going on? And I said, what do you want me to do? Stop. So I uh, absolutely love this piece of equipment. It takes a concrete core, a four, four inch diameter, inch tall cylinder, put it into a, 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 a clamp, put a 26 pound force underneath. That concrete is sandwiched between, uh, I believe it's nine steel balls, which it has a drill press on it, that you're revolving uh, somewhere between 1200 and 1700 RPM with a bunch of water coming out. Basically what you're doing is it's a 20 minute test and you're taking measurements every 50 seconds. So it's 24, uh, measurements over a 20 minute cycle and what we're looking for is an increase or resiliency to depth of wear. So this is our standard concrete and Georgia Department of Transportation has a specification that after 20 minutes you can't go over 0 0.03 inches of depth of wear and with our standard concrete we were going well above that and this was a 56 day soak in our mag chloride. Now what I was talking about before that cement paste, that capstone, is our first line of defense. I was talking about this section right here. This is that sacrificial layer. 
you're going to eventually lose that top surface. And what we want to do is we want to make that top surface as strong as possible to keep it around for as long as possible. Because once we get through that cement paste, that top layer, it's not just cement paste we're dealing with anymore. It's the interfacial zone. It's the aggregate. And once you start getting pullouts, which you can actually see in this photo. Am I there? Yeah. So you can start seeing some of these pullouts over here. I mean, they're gorgeous. But the aggregate is being torn out of the surface. Now you're creating a singularity, a space where more damage can occur, whether it's more water, more freezing, more mad chloride, and more abrasion. It's just a place where nastier things is going to happen. And the more of those that you make, the more your surface just gets torn up. Okay. So this was a 56 day, and this was a 90 day. Um, yeah, yeah, quite a difference. Now, I, I will say, um, the nano silica enhanced concrete still had a little bit more loss in abrasion, still had more depth of wear to it because we are soaking it in magnesium chloride for 90 days. And the expectation should be we're still going to see some damage. That being said, the difference is astounding. Okay. So again, I mean, that, that is the, the depth of the data that I wanted to present with you today. Um, at this point, I, I do want to open up the floor for any questions, um, but before I do so, there's a couple things I wanted to cover. First, there is a specification, a standard being written for colloidal silica and concrete. Um, it's a specification that is going to be unlike many other specifications because it does connect the science of what's in the bottle to what the end user needs to see back of the soup can. And right now, for, with ASTM, we're having a lot of problems with that, um, mainly because of the politics that we see at ASTM. Uh, but we're also trying to do something very, very difficult. Color or nanosilica acts like a supplementary cementitious material. But we receive it and use it in the form of an admixture, which the industry, the academics, y'all, it's very hard to digest. So if you haven't really picked this up yet, Everything that we're doing with nanosilica is going to take some courageousness from you. There isn't an ASTM that tells you what colloidal silica is. It's not published. This is a WK. This is a draft. And it's not going to be ready for at least another year or 10 years. And that's OK, because we do have means and methods to show the viability, the, valid, the, the validation of this material, the efficacy of it. And it's been done by more than one person, more than one company and by more than one country. When you ask these questions, and when you're thinking of your questions, I don't mind if they're nasty. I don't mind if you're mean to me. Please. I want to hear the nastiest questions you got. And I want to answer them as best as I can. If I don't have the answer today, I will get you that answer. But I want you all to realize, and I've said this is the third time I'm saying this, it's our job to stop this stuff from happening. Concrete cracks because it starts with the letter C. We can't be comfortable with that anymore. Whether you're doing a deck pour or a dam, replacing concrete is expensive. Depending on who, what article you read, cement accounts for 3 to 5% of the world's CO2 emissions. That's nothing. That is nothing compared to the amount of concrete we're throwing away and the CO2 impact of that, the concrete that we have to tear out and the CO2 impact of that, and more cement that we have to make. They're building 11 more cement production plants in India right now. Good for them. God bless. I mean, can you really build the Kosciuszko Bridge or the Veranzano Narrows Bridge out of lumber? And the answer is no. What is the carbon footprint of destroying that many trees? So as you ask these questions, I want you to focus on what my beautiful, wonderful wife once said. Our biggest problem in the industry is that we're solving today's problems with yesterday's technologies. Mike Thomas, professor at, I keep saying University of New Brunswick. Is that right? Yes. OK, good. He says that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different response. That's not the true definition, but I really like it. The, the dam in New Brunswick, right? OK, OK, fantastic. That, that dam in New Brunswick, they're replacing it with the exact same mix, and they're expecting a different response. They're doing the same thing here. And I am not allowed to tell you this location. They're doing the same thing here, replacing it. Granted, 
it's not the same exact mix because the materials that they used were from 20, 30 years before and the cement's different. The rock is a little different. The admixtures are different. But they still got a type 1, 2 Portland cement, still got a little bit of class F fly ash, and the aggregate is coming from the same, the same state or the same, what do you call it in Canada, province? So they're not using anything new, but they're expecting it to last the same amount of time or longer. Now, if that's not crazy, that's not insane. Please tell me what is. Because this type of stuff, look at that. It looks like something from a horror movie. It doesn't look real. And this is called usable concrete. Did you see that dam failure in New Braunfels, Texas? I did. How are dams failing? How are dams failing? You know how much money and materials go into dams? And we're OK doing something that we know fails? So when you ask this, these questions, be rude, be mean, ask me the questions that are going to make me shake in my boots. But I hope these questions are all based on the fact that you want to use a new and emerging technology, that you want to create a better concrete that is stronger and that lasts longer. I'd like to thank you for your time and open up the floor for any questions. First person to ask one is get some lucky concrete. Oh, there we go. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. What do you got? Uh, okay. Oh, more. So you we talked about academia and that's a huge hurdle, especially the ACI and the Brown. Um, and engineers hate to do something new or different. And, and I, I can speak on that a little. Sure. But the real question I have is give me like one or two other top you know pushbacks in what your response would be. Um, okay. Uh, if it's so great, how come I haven't seen it before? So these are not going to be scientific. And I've been doing this 30 years. Those are the two big pushbacks I get. That if it was so amazing, I would have known about it. Right? I would have heard about it. I would have used this before. And if they didn't learn about it, if they, it didn't manifest in their head, in their 30 years of experience, then it isn't worthwhile. I'm an engineer. I have two, three engineering degrees. And I'm, I'm a peacock. When I walk into the room, people know I'm here. Most engineers are not like me. They're very quiet people. They're like Eeyore from Pooh, right? Oh, OK. Um, but inside, they have an ego. When we go to school to be an engineer, I don't care if you're just at the baccalaureate level, you know how much time we spent. Who here took reinforced concrete? Who here took dynamics, thermodynamics? Soils, advanced soils. How horrible. Do you remember that AISC book? How much did it weigh? I have back problems from carrying all my books around. So when somebody brings us something new that we didn't find, it's almost an attack on our ego. And I know that's not probably the answer that you were looking for. It's more like, hey, well, we're not getting the air content that we want, or the strengths aren't there at 108. No. No, we have all that data that shows that this stuff is pretty amazing. It's getting past the personal level. It's getting the engineer, the owner, the contractor to say yes. Have you ever read the book Getting to Yes? Anybody here read the book Getting to Yes? I feel like that book was written with ready mix providers in mind. When we say no to a new technology, and I don't know if I've, said, I've given this presentation twice, when we say no to a new technology, we're saving money because we don't have to install anything. We're saving money because we don't have to train anybody. We're saving money because we don't have to tear anything out. We're saving money because we don't have to throw away rejected trucks. By saying no, we save money, time, and resources. By saying yes, ugh, I got to put in new equipment. I got to train my folk. I got to deal with rejected trucks. And what, who's going to pay for this when this gets torn out? I understand why you're saying no. I get it. But gosh, what happens when you say yes? What happens when you go through those obstacles? It's tough to be a superhero. You know, we're, I wasn't born on Krypton. I was born in Jersey. I was actually born in Brooklyn. And there are not many superheroes come from, well, besides Captain America. And he's awesome. Sorry. <laughs> You're good, brother. Um, it, it's hard to do what we do. And it's easy to get locked into, oh, I'm going to do this for the next 30 years, and I'm going to clip coupons and be happy with it. I get it, and I commend you for doing your job. This is the future. If we keep clipping coupons, everybody in this room is going to have to deal with this in your own portion of the industry. 
Hopefully I answered your question. One of, the, one of the biggest things that I think that people need to understand, ACI and ASTM, they're only, they're only recommendation guidelines. They're not the law. They're not regulations. The only thing we're committed to having to do is meet ADA and NFPA fire, and you can bend about anything else you want. Even the building code is bending. Um, so they're, they're basically recommendations. And depending on how hard you want to push and how much smoke you want to blow, you can usually do what you need to do to make the process work. Good and bad. Yeah. If you need to compress that, that timeline, if you told the end user, hey, I need 28 days, I need 120 days to cure this slab before I put that flooring in, huh, you tell them 120 days. So can you make it happen in three? Yeah. You find a way, right? Especially if you're the flooring contractor, seven days. You know, talking about ACI and ASTM, I, I wanna jump onto the university too. We, there's a huge disconnect between the university and the engineering community. And it is such a tragedy. Because you have to understand that we were once connected. You know, we were once a team where either something happened in the field and we didn't understand it as the practical level, we would bring it to the university and they would help us understand it. Or if we needed something new to either solve a problem or bring us a solution, we went to the university. There's a huge disconnect. I was at the, um, the Strategic Development Council for ACI in Denver. It was last year. Was anybody there? What's his name from the Charlie Panko Foundation? Not Charlie, Charles Panko Foundation, the president. I have it, I actually have it on video, which I wasn't supposed to do. Um, gave a presentation, and it was the most embarrassing presentation I've ever seen at ACI. The president of the Charles Panko Foundation, which funds the wood industry, the asphalt industry, and the concrete industry, basically said, we've been giving y'all $50,000 every year. $50,000 times three, actually 150 k for three projects. Where has that, um, what am I trying to say? Where has that information gone to? We paid for a research project. We haven't seen any of that research gone to the field. And this was the embarrassing point. You need to be like the asphalt industry and the wood industry. And you could, you could hear a pin drop because one thing that y'all know in the concrete industry, if you're not using concrete, it's your own asphalt. Right? Hey, you talk about concrete's killing the environment. I think asphalt's really killing the environment. But the harsh reality is ACI, the Strategic Development Council, the powers that be, are putting money, in my opinion, in the wrong places. In the Charles Pancombe Foundation, they're putting it in the wrong places. And my belief is because we have this disconnect. Now, I'm from university and I'm from the practical side. I'm trying to make that connection through my business, through my outings throughout the industry. So if you have a university, you have one of the best universities here for concrete. Purdue, you had Jason Weiss, now you have Luna Lou. If Jan Olick, I mean, some of the cool, and you have a, a place where they make hamburgers and they put peanut butter on it. I was supposed to go to Purdue. I wanted to go, I wanted to work with Jason Weiss. That was my dream. And I couldn't, unfortunately, my, my father had a heart attack and I had to go take care of him while I was doing my PhD. And I tell you, my PhD was one of the greatest adventures besides being a dad and a husband. But if you have problems, you can always work with your manufacturers, your suppliers. But if you have a true problem that everybody's having an issue with, like Class F fly ash, is it really good for mitigating freeze thaw and de-icing salts on a practical level? You go to the university, you start a project, and yes, they need money, they're a business. And the university's gonna take 50% off the top. So if it's a $150,000 project, it's really a $300,000 project. And that's okay, because they're gonna give us the answers. So ASTM, ACI, especially ACI is full of academics. ASTM still has a lot of academics, but it's not full of academics. And I love both of them. I'm not a big fan of World of Concrete, but that's a different story. So when you go to these ASCI, ACIs and ASTMs, and you hear that rhetoric of, hey, this is not practical. This is, this is somebody's PhD project that they're putting into an ASTM. I need you. I need you, the practical side of the industry, and wave the bullshit flag. Excuse me, wave the flag. We can edit that out, right? Sorry about that. Wave the flag. This is not going to work. This isn't real. 
how is this going to help me in the industry? Have you ever seen ASTM C1608? It is such a pretty test. You have a glass file, 55 millimeters tall by 22 millimeters in diameter, and you put three grams of cement paste in there to look at shrinkage over 24 hours. Where in the good God's green earth are you ever going to use that? It is a great scientific principle, but I had that once recommended to me by a civil engineer. Well, we need to see this for our residential driveways. What are you talking about, man? So I do think there's a disconnect. I think there's a disconnect, and some of the problems that we see from engineers is because of that disconnect. And the disconnect is in our schools, in our universities, as well as in our AECI's ASTMs. Long-winded answer. Next question. Yes, sir. Can you talk about the difference between silicates I feel like we had this discussion. We, we got into flooring right. quite a bit, and one of the things that's a real challenge is the fact that there's been a lot of products that have come to the market that are a silicate salt-based technology uh, that obviously don't have the same performance methods that you're talking about. So one of the main challenges to try to integrate concrete with flooring is how can you differentiate between the two and then clearly identify them so people understand what they're dealing with? Safety is the first. Um, with silicates, especially when I was working for the, the Army Corps, we had a lot of people get chemical burns from silicates. It's a caustic material, it's pretty nasty, uh, especially when you're using those high solid contents. But more importantly, when it comes down to the chemistry, when we're using a silicate, you have one SiO2 attached to either two sodium, two potassium, two lithium, but it's a lot of salt carrying a little bit of silica or silicate. What you're still going to see out of that is pozzolanic reaction. You're still going to see a consumption of calcium hydroxide to create calcium silicate hydrate. But the amount of salt that we're bringing with that, and a lot of what people don't understand, or a poor, uh, something that folks don't understand, is that nanoparticles are actually bigger than silicates. Silicates are solutes in solution. Nanoparticles are hardened particles in a colloidal dispersion. And we're not using as much salt with nanosilica. Yes, you still have to use salt. There are two ways of stabilizing nanosilica in solution. One is by using a salt, normally sodium oxide, or two, modifying the surface with a number of bells and whistles out there. So when it comes to the amount of salt, we're talking about, I think it's parts per million with silicates. With nanosilica, it's parts per billion or even less, depending on the type that you use. So with that, and one of the biggest problems we talked about when it comes to those glues breaking down, it's not just the moisture that makes a big deal. It's the alkalis and it's the pH change. What was the pH value said? 12 and a half? Right, once you get over 11, most glues start to fail. And we're putting a high pH material on top of our slab. And I'm sorry, but you're not, I don't care how much you clean that sl slab. I mean, you could blast the surface out, grind the surface, and cut down, but then what was the point of using that silicate to begin with? So using a silicate, I believe, I, I still don't understand why we're using silicate-based densifiers for resilient flooring. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. It seems like we're creating the environment for failure. Am I saying that correctly, James? No, I mean, I, mean, I agree that that's been the issue we face because they're, it, it's so closely related terminology that people love sure. together. And when I first started looking at this technology, I, I threw it in the same basket myself. Right. Yeah, and a lot of people say colloidal silicate. It's colloidal silica or nanosilica. The reason why I say colloidal silica, by the way, to give you a definition, nanosilica can either be dry or wet or liquid form. I prefer the liquid form as opposed to the dry form. And when we say colloidal silica, what we're saying is, you know, if you drink milk or if you drink colloidal or Coca-Cola, uh, it's a colloidal suspension of, let's say, milk, it's fats and proteins. So when we're saying colloidal silica, it's just a universal suspension of nanosilica particles. And very different, both environmental health and safety, as well as the performance that you're going to get out of the concrete. Thank you for that question. Questions? Come on, Jim. Got to have one question. Uh, talk about curling stresses. Curling. So I call it the dancing of the slab. And uh, when you come out to Colorado, come see me. You'll take 24 out to our lab, and you got to sing when you take 24. And you go, uh, there's that new MIT from the Concrete Sustainability <coughs> Hub, that app that does the car. I'm doing that once I get home. Um, curling, I've seen it more in pavements 
than I've seen it in industrial warehouses just because I spent most of my career out in pavements on airfields. And I mean, if you don't know the mechanisms of curling, then it's really hard for you to understand what goes on with curling. But basically what you have, and I believe a short definition is warranted, you have your slab. And your slab has an evaporation loss or a moisture loss from the top surface. The bottom surface doesn't lose moisture. And the bottom surface is also restrained. And I don't care if you got a double sheet, I don't care if you got 10 mil poly, it's more restrained than the top surface. So if you feel like a poly is gonna get rid of your warping problems, it might, but not all of it. So what happens is you got this moisture loss at the top, you end up having this volume change or this volume shrinkage at the, the top surface. The bottom surface has all the moisture, it's restrained, it doesn't want to shrink. So what the slab ends up doing is dancing or smiling, as my, my wonderful wife says, it smiles. I said, well, we're smiling and dancing, it's a great day. Um, and what we see from that is a deterioration of the concrete slab. The, you, know, you see it in joints, you feel it in joints, and then you dip in. Um, with nanosilica, what we are doing, I, I keep using that phrase, effectively manipulating blah, blah, blah. And while I don't like that 1608 test with the glass vial, what it does show us is through a normal Portland cement, when it hydrates, as it hydrates, we have a certain pore structure that's developed. And because we have that pore structure, we have to fill up those pores with water. And that's what this test shows. With nanosilica, we don't see that volume change. We don't see those pores open up because we're getting more accelerated cement dissolution, we're using up our bulk, bulk water, and we're creating more hydrated phases, which reduces that or resists that volume change that you're gonna see from your evaporation. And what does that come out as? The reduction in curling, We've seen major reduction in plastic shrinkage or elephant, uh, elephant skin or alligator cracking at the top of your slab when you're trying to finish it. And ultimately, oh, Joe's not here. Ultimately, what we see is this internal curing that helps reduce that warping effect. And I tell you, my favorite test is that, that warping beam from the Army Corps. Love that test. We also did some photogrammetry. Totally didn't work. That was a waste of money and a waste of time. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Now. As engineers growing up through school, F prime C, our compressive strength, ACI 318 takes that F prime C and it uses it in everything. Flexural strength, tensile strength, split tensile strength. You can even use the unit weight with your compressive strength to identify your modulus of elasticity. So really the most important test is your compressive strength test. But outside of that, for a new technology, I agree with you, sir, that ASTMs and ACIs, they're, how did you say it, not convoluted, but, yeah, I, whatever you said, that it is, a, what's that? Collusion. Collusion, thank you. So these tests, to me, are very important when you're in your immediate localized environment. And it's never one test. That's my biggest problem. ACI forces you to hang your hat on one test. I mean, shoot, even if you look at Ashto rigid pavement design, I mean, at least the old method, you looked at one material property. And when going through school, ACI 318, ACI 214, ASTMs are all based on compressive strength. I, I believe it's a handful of tests, and it depends where you're at. So for here in Indiana? It depends on what you're trying to achieve. It's not what test what you're trying to achieve, how you're trying to use it. If I'm a flooring manufacturer, or if I'm a, a resilient flooring contractor, or if I'm a pavement contractor, I'm going to do two. We're all going to do compressive strengths. Compressive strength will, will follow, but based on, you know, you've got your relative humidity, you've got your shrinkage, um, free stall, corrosion of steel. I mean, there's so many. Meet what you're trying to do, and it just, it's, it's really kind of a caveat to whatever. I want to do that, use it for this, so let's test for that. Right. And that being said, it, it's not just you as the ready mix provider or the contractor that makes that decision. It's also the end user, the engineer, everybody has to come together. When I give these presentations, you know, people ask me specific tests. Have you done surface resistivity? Yes. I got lucky. You know, have we done the creep test? No. I haven't even thought about that test yet. But we've done restrained shrinkage. We've done cracking with restrained shrinkage. We've done restrained shrinkage and cracking in a, a C156 environment, 32% relative humidity, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, with wind going over it. So one of the things that I always say is look at the data. Fall in love with my data. Read the PhD. But good concrete practices dictate that you have to try it on your own. 
that you have to do demos and use the tests that are important to you. And when you get those tests, or, or before you do those tests, you have to put up your target. If you don't put up the target before you do the test, how do you know if you hit the bullseye? Every time I run a project, every time I run a project, I do an action plan. My action plan defines who I am, what we're going to be doing, what we're looking for, and how we're going to do it. Without that, who the hell, where are we going? So if you are going to run those specific tests, make sure you have a reason to run the test, not I'm running the test for the sake of running the test. Like how many people in here have actually run, used, and looked at RCPT data? You have to. If you're working for a DOT, or how many of our flooring contractors, and I don't want hands on this, have run both the relative humidity and the MVER in the way that it's supposed to be run. So a lot of these things go hand in hand, and if you want to get a true, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful or rude there, but just really, how many have done it the right way? So use the text, test that is specific to you and your end need. Yes, sir? If you're increasing the margin for your business, that means as a contractor that's advantageous, that means the owner can be advantageous, and you're able to then talk to an owner and say, look, I can, release, I can decrease your overall risk for your company. So the contractor can increase the margins uh, and be able to decrease his own internal risk for protective care because he'll be in the suit no matter what. Then you're talking about people with the finishers and other parts. The real value proposition of business strategy decision requires the underlying science. Once you understand the underlying science is there, now it's just on what you would normally make your decisions based on anything. If I gave you a product that increases your margin, you have to consider that. Then you have to say, is my margin Significantly increased in operating care that way. That's a different calculation that each of the different parties will have to make depending on their insurance risk management schemes that are in play. And ultimately, if my competitor is using this and making a lot more money and much larger margin, that's a disadvantage. And so ultimately, what happens here is it's a market proposition. And when I first started talking to Joe, that was my first thing. Well, there are two. One is the science has to be correct. Mm -hmm. It took us a long time to figure this out, by the way. Because, you know, a lot of stuff that you're talking about, the academic way to think about it, is completely volatile. It's very hard to figure out. Uh, and then secondly, it had to make real business sense. So he's delightful. I mean, really not a nice person. <laughs> uh, you know, it's great to talk about your grandkids, but that's not the decision making made. Decision making matrix is how does this make more money in the short term and or long term and or decrease my overall risk profile so that it's worthwhile to you. That, that, that's you sitting there, whether you're an estimator, whether you're a specifier, whether you're a you know, contractor, or a GC sub, those are the decisions you have to make. And the hurdles that have to be jumped, yes, they're the problem that you can get and so forth. Uh, but once you have the underlying science, what you're saying. You don't need permission from all these other people to do it. You just need to know, hey, I can increase my margin. Mm -hmm. Hey, I can decrease my risk. Those guys want to keep absorbing that risk and paying a lot more money. God bless them because it makes them less competitive to me. So you assume the risk no matter what. I mean, <laughs> you don't need to take on a job. Even if the specifications are written right, even if the architect approves your submittal, you still own it and you're still responsible for it. So many times when we go into a project, we look at the project and we say, he wants X, well, we can give him X, but we're going to do it a different way. And they're like, that's fine, you own it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's how much risk are you willing to take right. to make your money. And that's what business is all about. You know, people ask me when I go to uh, Vegas if I gamble. I say, no, I own my own company. I gamble all the time. <laughs> In some of y'all's positions, you're gambling every single day. And sometimes you're gambling on a bad horse. I mean, you're putting all your money on a technology that is antiquated and has been proven by many, fo many folks not to work. But even more than that, it does harm to your concrete. So I understand we are in, a, in an, almost in a risk-averse industry. I would call it a risk management industry. 
And what I love about nanosilica, it gives you a little bit more of an umbrella or an insurance policy. Sorry if I used that the incorrect way. Yes, sir. In your exterior path, we talked earlier in the first session about curing, you know, not necessarily you want to use white pig or anything like that. Oh, yeah. With the help of nanosilica. Right. Right. Yes, sir. What about sealers? What about sealers? Oh, that's a tricky one. You see, I mean, if, if we're in a, a restaurant, or if we're in a food manufacturing facility where you have a significant amount of caustic materials falling on the floor, I mean, your nanosilica enhanced concrete is going to show uh, a lot of resiliency to that. Uh, Whitney ran a, a beautiful research study for a sewage, uh, precast sewage, uh, precast concrete sewage pipe company uh, just on that, and we showed that nanosilica can increase resiliency to acid attack. But that being said, I mean, if you can put an industrial-based epoxy on it to enhance the life, I mean, you're going to be better off. If you can put a sealer, you're going to be better off because, I mean, it's just the science of it. Once you get below a pH of 3.2, your calcium silicate hydrate st structure starts falling apart. We had worked with a second company that was, uh, they were an iron ore company, and they had this vat that they kept their secret juice in to extract all the ore out of. And they were replacing this concrete basin every six months. And we talk about value-added proposition. My question was, well, what if you can increase that to eight months or 12 months? And you had to see their eyes. Like, so when can we start using this stuff? Not, let me see the data set. We want to do a pilot. No, no, no. They were like, you can extend it to eight months, and we're making money. Because every time you got to replace that bin, you got to shut it down. you got to throw it away. you got to do something with the juice. That secret juice, man. I had a pH at 2.4. It was awesome. awesome stuff, awesome stuff. So they had tried everything, and by using the nanosilica, they increased service life. And they're doing well. They're doing well. Even the, uh, the folks up in Aspen with their, uh, their cats that take the snow off, when they go into their parking lots, they have titanium teeth, and it just chews up the concrete like warm butter. They were using nanosilica to increase the resiliency, and they needed to go from, was it one year to two years? And by doing that, they never have to shut down. They can keep more people coming in. And they don't have to sue anybody either. Value out of performance. If the water is trapped inside, eventually it has to come out. No, it doesn't. No. Why does it have to come out? Well, it doesn't even have to be consumed. And I can go into this in a little bit more. So I'm doing a postdoctorate because why not go back to school, right? Um, but colloidal or nanosilica is amazing. And Joe, you've done amazing things. And I said this to you yesterday, and this is why, you know, Joe drives fast. He didn't drive over the speed limit. Megan, he easy. Don't ride with Joe. I was. I was riding with Joe. Did you get sick? No. We had an amazing conversation about the evolution of nanosilica technology. Because nanosilica, and Joe, this is in that Euler book, nanosilica is barely, barely scratching the surface. What I'm getting into now is something called nanosilica-based hydrogels. And what we could do with nanosilica, and this gets me all giddy, and what we could do with nanosilica is build these three-dimensional structures in our concrete that not only holds onto water, holds onto water, but that water goes from a sealing effect to a healing effect. And what I mean by that is when the nanosilica hits our cement pore solution, which is made up of calcium, sodium, and potassium, what happens is it changes the electrical double layer, the surface potential around our particle. And instead of those particles bouncing off of each other, they bounce and they stick. And they start forming these three-dimensional structures that hold in calcium hydroxide, they hold in silica, and because I said it's a hydrogel, they're also holding in water. Now initially, what these things are going to do is just hold in water, and that's why you see that relative humidity. I wouldn't say spike, but definitely be higher over longer periods of time, or short, long durations. What we're going to see out of that hydrogel, that nanosilica-based hydrogel, is there is going to be a consumption of calcium hydroxide. And because it's locked in those pores, what we're effectively doing is locking up those pores. And that's where the MVER comes into play. Because relative humidity, we're either drilling down into our slab or we're putting a sensor in our fresh concrete in our slab. So it's contained in our slab. And we really don't care about the moisture or the alkalis in that moisture until it migrates to the surface at a moisture vapor emission rate. And that's why we do, is it the 2170 or the 1869? I always get the two confused. Um, so what we're seeing out of the colloidal silica is actually locking up that water, which is going to be consumed 
over long periods of time, but not seven days, not 28 days. It's more going to be your 56, 90 days where you're going to see your standard concrete is going to be here and your nano silica concrete with relative humidity, your nano silica concrete is going to eventually do this. Right? It is going to consume that and there's going to be a plateau point, but it is going to consume that water over longer periods of time. That being said, even though short periods of time, we're not going to see that consumption, it's still not going to allow that moisture to migrate in the form of vapor. Does that make sense? Ish? Yeah, so, the, the conversation makes sense. I've not done the testing comparison myself, but just confused about, about the data because we typically think the moisture, if the humidity is higher, then eventually it's going to work its way to the surface and, and we're going to have a failure before. If, if you have a porous matrix, a porous cement paste, yes, you're absolutely right. But if you're locking that up, if you're actually using that water, consuming it, as well as locking it down, you're not going to see that moisture vapor emission rate. You need that porosity, that capillary, you know, those channels and whatnot, but we're locking those up. Yes, sir? Jump onto the PhD. We actually did some petrographic analysis using scanning electron microscopy and backscattered electron microscopy. And we did a, a pore structure analysis. And then we did a phase development analysis. So we used something called ImageJ software and energy dispersive x-ray analysis to do an elemental uh, composition analysis. And basically what you saw is less anhydrous cement or unreacted cement, more calcium silicate hydrate, and less pores. And I tell you, it's awesome photos that we used. And it's something that you, we have repeated using uh, a number of labs throughout the uh, country, uh, throughout the world, excuse me. Oh. I love talking about concrete. <laughs> <laughs> it's just awesome.